and amen. I, I want to kind of give you somewhat of an overview, a summary, a theme, if you will, of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet. He is one of the major prophets, and he uses uh, various forms of, of, of communication, be it poetry or be it preaching. He uses different means of communication to paint the picture and to bring the people of God to a place where they are turning back to God. You see, God has foretold that a captivity in Babylon would occur and that that captivity would last a 70-year period. Nevertheless, while God is a God of judgment, while God is a God of justice, while God is a God of correction, he is also a God of mercy. And he tells the people that if they would turn back to him, that he would have mercy, that he has prepared judgment and he has prepared calamity and he has prepared uh, 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 times of, of, of prosecution, if you will, and persecution as a means to correct the nation. And he's saying, but if you turn to me, I will show you a great degree of mercy. You see justice and mercy kiss through the message of the prophet Isaiah. However, the, we see that he is also a prophet who preaches of a Messiah, of one who is to come, who is the embodiment of everything he's preaching, who is the fulfillment of the promises, who is the seed of a woman, who is the solution to all of the troubles and the problems in the world, not only the injustices that are happening within the nation and without the nation, but the sinfulness, the brokenness, the iniquity that is festering, that is, that is being perpetrated, that is, being, uh, that is multiplying among the hearts and minds of the people. This solution is a savior, none other than Jesus. And so Isaiah seeks to paint the picture of a Messiah who is to come as a solution and to remind the people of Israel that they are chosen to be the vehicle by which God delivers the solution of the, to the world, that they are not this people who are prestigious and higher and better than others. They are a chosen people who God intends to use to paint the picture and to usher in the one person who has a solution to every one of humanity's problems. And here, in Isaiah chapter number 58, there is injustice. There is not just injustice as it relates to foreign outside nations doing things to Israel. And yes, we live in a culture where there are external nations that are doing things that are destructive to other nations. But there was a reality in Israel that there was an internal corruption. There was an internal degradation. There was internal injustice. And what was happening is the injustice while the people were crying for God's justice as it related to what was happening to them externally. They were complicit. They were compliant with injustice that was happening on the inside of the nation. And so Isaiah writes this particular part of this, of this story. He proclaims, he prophesies, and he preaches what it looks like when the people of God respond rightly to injustice. And so I want to take you through uh, that this morning. The first thing I want you to write down is Isaiah brings the people back to what I call a return to an awareness of personal brokenness. You see, many times as we look in the world today, we talk about the brokenness within our government. We talk about the chaos and the corruption, the division between Republican and Democrat, between liberal and conservative. We talk about the conflicts externally. We talk about those who are pro-life versus those who are pro-choice. We talk about racial injustice, systemic racism. We talk about black versus white. We talk about rich versus poor, but we often talk about them in the context as, as, as if we're viewers of this reality that's happening on the outside and are, are, are directly and in some cases indirectly affected by the atrocities that are happening externally. But I come to submit to you this morning that Isaiah brings the people to this reality that there are not just injustices happening in Nineveh and in Assyria. There are not just injustices happening in Babylon and in Philistia. And, and in, and in Philistia. They're not just uh, uh, injustices happening in these foreign nations. There are injustices and there is inequity and there is iniquity 
in the house of Jacob. And I come to submit to you this morning that you see, I believe as a culture, we want to be, we want to be comforted, but we do not want to be corrected. We want to be celebrated, but we do not want to be convicted. We want to be told how good we are. We want to be praised and we want to be exalted, but we do not want to be poked and prodded for righteousness. We live in a culture where across pulpits, across America, especially in Western civilization, we're preaching a, 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 a correctionless and a sinless gospel. We are preaching prosperity, and we are preaching goodness, and we are preaching love. But the Bible says that whom the Lord loveth, he chastens, he corrects. And so there is a correctiveness that is, is necessary in the people among the people of God. In fact, the Bible says that judgment begins at the house of God. You see, the injustice that we see, listen, let me help you understand something. That the, 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 the influence and the power of the church, if you look historically and you look at slavery, there is the, the, the historical 400 years of slavery. My question is, where is the church? Where is the people who know Jesus and the people who are empowered with the word of God and the truths of the scripture? Where are they to stand up and to cry out and to cry aloud, as, as Isaiah says, to spare not and to make the people aware of their transgressions and of their iniquity before God? That what they're doing is unjust, that what they're doing is unfair, that what they're doing is, in, is, is not only iniquity, but it is inequity. It's not reasonable. Where is the church? And I want to submit to you that when you look back historically, you see that the church is often silent. The church is silent on those issues. And in many cases, the church is being, is, is advantaged. They find ad advantageous circumstances during those time periods. And it was in fact Martin Luther King who had, who wrote the letter to the church from the, the, the prison in Birmingham, who wrote letters to, to religious individuals who were crying, wait and be patient. He wrote from the Birmingham jail that we need to move now, that we must do what is right now, that justice is necessary now, and that injustice in the black community, injustice in the poor community, injustice in the broken community is injustice everywhere, and it affects you, and it impacts you, and so he had a scathing message, and let me submit to you, while we have Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and we have uh, schools named after him and roads named after him. The truth of the matter is that his approval rating when he was alive was nothing remotely close to his approval rating today because there were people who felt like you just need to wait. And so Isaiah, he is not an approved prophet. He is not someone that people are looking forward to hearing. He is someone who comes and who says, while you want to criticize the injustice happening out there, there is a brokenness within that must be addressed. You see, notice in the text, if you look with me back in Isaiah chapter number 58, just before, and while you're turning back to Isaiah 58, I want you to find your place in Psalm 139. We're going to jump to Psalm 139 here in just a moment, but notice the writing of Isaiah in the text. He says, yet, verse number two, yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. So wait a second. There seems to be this conflict, right? Isaiah is going to cry aloud. He's going to spare not. He's going to make the people of God aware of their iniquity. But then he's going to say that you seek God daily. And you delight to know my ways. And you are a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances, the laws, the precepts of their God. The acts of God, ordinances of justice. So they're actually asking God for justice. And they delight in approaching to God or in God approaching to them. What he's saying is he, he is... He, he is taking a counter intellectual approach and he's saying that all of the things that you do are religious formalism. They are a form of worship that is done with the hands but not the heart. You see, 
I want you to understand, you, we must come to this place even though we go to church on Sunday, we read our Bible in the morning, we pray three times a day, right? We, 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 we give in tithes and offering. We must also come to this reality, this awareness of our own personal brokenness. That many times we do things out of habit and not from the heart. Many times we do things out of duty, but not desire. You see, and this is not just in a religious, in, 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 in a corporate religious setting. You see, many of us are spouses out of duty. The Bible says, husband, love your wife. And so you love your wife because it is your duty, but your wife wants you to love her because it is your desire. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. You see, you submit yourself because it is your duty and it is your responsibility. But there's a heart that says, I'm not submitted. I'm not under. What I want is power and what I want is control. But you see, your husband wants you to submit to him, to lift him up, to exalt him as your leader, as your Lord, as your head. You say, well, wait, he's not my Lord. Well, Sarah called her husband Lord. She understood his leadership. And so he wants you not to submit to him as a form of duty, but because you want to. You see, we have to come to the place where we want to. And here's why. Because it's only a matter of time. If you're doing it out of duty, it's only a matter of time before you justify why it's no longer your duty. But if you do it from the heart, if you do it from a transformed lifestyle, you'll find that it is indeed sustainable to walk in righteousness and to do what God has called you to do. If you would turn to Psalm 139 and you'll see this concept. And so I want you to look at this text and I want you to look at it personally. Don't look at it corporately. Don't look at it nationally, but look at this text personally. And my question to you is do do you do what you do out of duty or desire? Do you want God? Do you want him? The, the, the writer in the, in the short poem, The Cloud of Unknowing, he says, look thee, loathe to think on aught but God himself. He's saying, don't think of yourself. Don't think of your pleasures. Don't think of your desires. Don't think of your interests. But in everything you do, think of God. Long for him. Wives submit because your expression is a, it is a representation of Jesus who submitted himself to Pilate. Jesus who submitted himself to the Sanhedrin council. Jesus who submitted himself to a humanity that he could have snapped his fingers in an instant and destroyed. You see, submission is not a position of weakness, but submission is a realization of power. You see, husbands, love your wives, not because it is your duty and your obligation, but love your wives because it is the expression of Jesus loving his church. The Bible says that he gave himself for it and that he might sanctify it that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. And so I'm submitting to you, do you do what you do out of duty? Do you stroke a tithe, a tithe check out of duty? Do you open your Bible out of some form of habit? Or are you sincerely and earnestly yearning for, longing for, seeking after God? Hear the psalmist David in Psalm 139. Look with me, if you will, at the last two verses. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, he is aware of his own brokenness. He's aware of his inability to identify his own brokenness. You see, we have the sin nature that although we're saved, we have been released from the penalty and the power of sin. And one day we'll be released from the very presence of sin. We still deal with this carnal, this flesh, this broken nature. And the writer is aware that he has a blind spot. And so my question to you is, do you go to God and do you say, listen, have you ever had a time where you look in the mirror and you realize that you're not as good as you think you are? 
We have this tendency to, to ignore our own brokenness, to ignore our own failures, but to see the failures of others. You see, we can question the leadership of government officials and those who are in positions of power. We can look at their faults, the pastors, the politicians. We can look at their failures, those who are in leadership, their inadequacies and their inabilities. But do we see our own inconsistency? Do we see our own inadequacy? Do we see our own deficiency? Do we see our own failures? Do we see that we're not on time when we're supposed to be on time? Do we see that we lack inspiration and motivation to do the things that we're supposed to do? Do we have this realization, like the Apostle Paul, that the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing? Do you see yourself? Do you find yourself bitter? Do you find yourself angry unnecessarily? Do you find yourself having used your speech to tear down than to build up. And so we live in a culture today where people think, well, I didn't say it with my mouth, but you said it with your fingers. Can you go back and look at your post and realize that that post had no intent to edify, it was divisive and destructive, and that you can repent and take it down and perhaps apologize to the people who you've offended for saying it. But we live in a culture that wants to correct everyone else except ourselves. We want to address everybody else's brokenness, you see. And so Isaiah comes to the people of Israel and he says, you want to talk about the injustices of Babylon and Assyria and Nineveh and Lebanon and Philistia and all these foreign nations. But what about your iniquity? What about your brokenness? What about your religious formality? What about your worship? And you say, well, I'm going to church, but your worship is born out of your hands, but not out of your heart. It is outward and it is not inward. It is duty and it is not desire. You see, so we must return to an awareness of personal brokenness. You say, well, there's injustice in the world. You want to begin to correct the injustice in the world. You don't begin by correcting the brokenness in others You begin by correcting the brokenness in yourself. The murder, the violence, the rape, the the betrayal. We must look in the mirror and we must see that what's happening in the world is a reflection of the people. The violence in the world is a reflection of the hatred in the heart of people. And, And it is a reality that we too deal with hatred, greed, the corruption of power. We, we deal with indifference and apathy. We deal with, in our own versions, of racism and elitism and prejudice. We have those things in our own heart. And if we refuse to accept and admit and deal with those things, we cannot marvel and wonder why the world is perpetuating violence, iniquity, inequity, and injustice. So we must return to an awareness of our own personal brokenness. But not only must we return to an awareness of our own personal brokenness, notice what Isaiah says in what remains of the text. We must find the fast that the Father approves. And I'm going to give you, and I want to kind of anchor down, I want to build a tent here because I want to make an appeal to you, those of you who are watching, those of you who will watch at later times, I want to make an appeal to partnership with you because as I've studied this and prepared this, God has moved my heart to to actually begin implementing, not just inspiring, but implementing activities that will address the injustices in the world. And so here, uh, Isaiah is going to make this comparison between the fast that Israel is doing and the fast that God desires. And so here's the fast that Israel is doing. Here's what it results in. Their fasting has become a means to an end. So if you have been with us or or, or followed us, we did a series on church disciplines. And one of the disciplines we talked about was prayer. Another one we talked about was fasting. And we talked about what fasting is. We defined it. And so fasting is is the means by which I deny, I decrease my physical so that I can increase and experience the spiritual, right? And so I deny my flesh food so that I can hear the Father spiritually and get spiritual food, right? I turn off the video games or the television or the reality shows so that I can experience God's reality, 
God's history, God's story, so that I can, I can, I, I, I my, my, my body, my, this, my vessel, who I am, is a, it, it's a tower, and there's signals that come to it, and I want the signal from heaven to come to me, not the signal from the flesh or the signal from earth, and so I dampen, I deny my flesh, so that I can experience the heightened experience, the heightened reality of who God is, and so that's what fasting is, and so they're fasting. However, they're fasting for something. They're fasting for a reward. And, and listen, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't fast for something, right? We're fasting for a reason. But here's some of us, I, I, we fast because we want God to bless us financially. We fast because uh, we want wisdom in a decision. And I'm not saying those things are bad. But fasting just became this tool to get what we want. It becomes a means to an end. And what God is saying is, you're not fasting for me. You're fasting for my stuff. You're not fasting to see my face. You're fasting to get what's in my hand. And so they're fasting but it's become a means to an end. And you notice, here's why. Because they ex th their exclamation is that, God, we're fasting, and you don't even acknowledge it. So their purpose for fasting was their own pleasure and their own acknowledgement. They wanted to fast so that God would do this. <laughs> Great job. It is what Jesus told the Pharisees. He said that you fast and you frown down your face and you stand on the street corners and you and you look like you're fasting and you do it so that men will pass you by and think that you're spiritual. And what he says is that what you should do is you should enter into your closet and you should fast privately. And when you are, when you resurface from your closet, you should put a smile on your face and you should wash your face because the goal of the fast is not the accolades, is not the acknowledgement, is not the approval, is not your ultimate pleasure. The goal of the fast is so that God would move you out of the way and that he would resurface, that he would be made known, that he would be expressed. That is the goal of the fast. So if you're fasting, the goal is not so that you can get some stuff. The goal is so that you will decrease and God will increase. Their fasting becomes an expression of hypocrisy. Notice what the Bible says, God, Isaiah says to the children of Israel, he says that you find pleasure, but you exact labor. So, so think about this for a second. He says, you're looking for what's going to make you feel good, but you're expecting others to work and labor while you feel good. So I want you to ask yourself, see, we look at fasting and we're going to get pigeonholed into the notion of fasting, but I want you to think spiritual discipline, right? Do you... Hold others to expectations that you don't meet. Th that's a question. Do you expect the president to tell the truth, but you don't? Do you expect police to be merciful and compassionate, but you're not? Do you expect the church to be generous and benevolent, but you're not? Do you expect your children to clean their rooms, but you don't? Do you expect your children to save their money and invest in the market, but you don't? Do you expect your wife to clean the room, but you don't? Do you expect your husband to pick up his socks, but you won't? The question is that your fasting becomes an expression of hypocrisy. You see, this is the corporate context. We look around at everyone else's brokenness and we want them to be like us or like a version of themselves that we think they should be. But when the doors close and the blinds shut, we're nothing like the version that we expect others to be. You see, we must find the fast that the Father approves. We must look to what God says is an appropriate fast. And you see, this would be difficult if God doesn't detail for us what his fast is, then we would be left, we would be subject to the interpretations of Isaiah or of the people or the interpretations 
of some exposition of some preacher or some pastor. And so God does not leave a room for error, a room for misunderstanding. What God does is he clearly defines what his fast is. And so this is where I'm asking you as children of God, as individuals who are following Jesus, if you're say, if you're naming the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to partner with me in this in these particular these three efforts. And here's the first one. He says that you should lift the burdens and release the captives. Notice what he says. It is such a fast. Is this a, is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Verse five. Is it, his bow, is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? So he's going to ask you, this is the fast, and he's going to detail it. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens. And so here's what I'm asking you to do. Here's what God has laid on my heart. As, as an effort, as an activity that Palm Bay Baptist Church, soon to be River of Life Christian Center, needs to do in this local community. We need to lift burdens and release the captives. I believe that there are people who are addicted and they're overwhelmed not only to food, but to drugs and to sex in our community. And I believe that we need to implement a recovery program in our church. I believe that we need to alleviate the burden of people in our community, not to to call them wicked and condemn them and castigate them and ostracize them. But we must seek to work together to relieve them of their burdens. Not only do I believe that we need to have a recovery program, I believe that we need to return to a prison ministry. There's an organization that I have in partnership. I believe that we should extend our resources. We should extend our support. We should be in the prison. You see, Jesus said, when I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I believe that an expression of a transformed life is one who relieves the burdens of others and releases them from the bondage of wickedness in their life. You see, we can condemn the person who lies, but how often are we willing to bear the burden of the liar? We can condemn the promiscuous woman, but how often can we come alongside of her and and bear the burden of her addiction? And bear the burden of her brokenness. We can condemn the young man with his pants sagging below his waist. We can condemn the man who is selling drugs in the community. But can we come beside him and can we show him a better way? Can we provide for him a means of income? Can we begin businesses that will provide jobs? Can we begin programs that will relieve people from this experience they're having? From the bondage of of addiction, of drugs, from the bondage of brokenness. Do we have what it takes? And so I believe the first thing is... We must lift burdens and release captives. And I believe we do that by having a a, a recovery program and a prison ministry. The second thing is this. We must engage and empower the poor. Notice what it says. He says, and that thou, is it it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? He's saying, here's God's fast for you. Lift the burdens and release the captives. Engage and empower the poor. So what are the poor? Who are the poor? You see, the the poor people that Isaiah is referring to, he's referring to people who cannot buy, who cannot sell, and who cannot work to get means to be ordered to buy and sell. So let's walk through this, right? You need money to be able to buy. You need product to be able to sell. So in order to acquire product, you either need to buy product or have product given to you so that you can sell it. But in order to be able to acquire, accumulate money, you have to be able to work. You see, the lame man that is sitting outside of the beautiful gate in the, in the, at the temple, he is lame and he can't work. So his, his day job was to beg for alms. I can't go work for money, so I'll have you give me money so I can go buy some food. When you drive past the person on the side of the road and they're asking for money, it's because they're lacking in the means to acquire money so that they can buy a necessity. And so what happens is what we tend to do is we look at people and say, well, you're not lame. You can work. But the lameness is not just physical lameness. 
The lameness is also emotional lameness. There are people who are depressed and discouraged and dismayed and broken and they can't find a job. There are people who have a history of failure, a history of brokenness, and no one will hire them. There are people who have, a, who have come out of a culture and a context of brokenness and suffering and lack and inadequacy, and they don't have a means. And so before you look at them in judgment, we ought to say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto you. Rise up and walk. You see, what Isaiah is saying is that you must engage, intentionally engage the poor because you work and because you have bread and you have money, you look down your nose at those who don't. God says, here's my fast for you. Take your bread and give it to the poor. And so here's the second program we need to implement. We need to implement a food pantry. Oh, well, we got food pantries all over the city. And there are people who take advantage of food pantries all the time. Notice that Isaiah doesn't say, offer it to those who don't take advantage and screen everybody and make sure that they don't. He says, here's what we should do. Jesus would feed the hungry and he would care for the impoverished. I believe as a church, it is our responsibility to offer food to the broken, food to the hungry. There are kids, children, who are going to school without food, who are hungry. That's why the school programs offer breakfast for free for kids, because they want to give them the, the most essential meal of the day so that they can function and learn and be educated. We live in a culture and in a society where we look down our nose at those who have lack, and you see the gospel is a message of wealth to the poor. Not their own necessarily accumulated wealth. It's God blessed you so that you can bless them. And so the third program, so we must engage and empower the poor. The third program is we must clothe the naked. Notice what Isaiah says. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, Stop talking about the young lady who comes to church without clothing on and calling her a promiscuous woman, an adulterous woman, an immoral woman, and start coming alongside of her and, and, and buying her next outfit. Let her pick it, but you buy it. The, 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 the heartbeat here is that there needs to be, so, so here's the third program that I think we ought to in, implement as our church. We ought to offer people clothing. We ought to have, even if it's, even if it's a, a program where, listen, ladies, and this is primarily for ladies, most of the time, you know, men will wear something with holes in it. It'll be falling apart. It's got stains and oil and tears and tatter, and we'll wear it. We don't care. We'll go to Walmart. We'll go to church. We'll go everywhere else. And so th there's a community of people. This is more so for, for women, ladies in our community, but ladies, you know you got too many pairs of shoes in the closet. You got too many shoes. You got shoes that you ain't worn in six years either because they're too small or because they don't, you don't have anything else to wear with it. Ladies, you got you to, gotta, and most of the time it's ladies. I'm not saying that men don't do it too. Men, we got, you know, I got friends who have hundreds of sneakers in their closet. They, they are just collectors. And, and I'm somewhat guilty. I have a collection of loafers and sneakers and all kind of stuff. And so why should we depend? Why should we say, well, hey, we got a Goodwill down the street. Go down to Goodwill and get you some clothes. When as a church, we can have our own program where we're able to clothe the naked, where we're able to take our excess. Some of us on this, on this live, you know you're a hoarder. You know you got too much stuff and you could be a blessing. You can take your bread and give it to the hungry. You can take your clothes and give it to the naked. So three things I want you to partner with me. Three programs. The first one is a, is, is, is a prison program that includes, uh, that includes recovery, breaking people free from the bondage of addiction. The second program is a program that feeds the community. We ought to be able to feed people in our community if we partner with another organization. And the third program is a clothing program, a program that will clothe people. I believe that as a church that we need to do more than to focus on the internal matters and the internal issues. We need to be a church that reaches out to our community. It blessed my heart to see another brother in Christ 
doing blessing bags for the community, putting things together like toothpaste and soap and reaching out to people who are broken in our community. You may not know this, but there are homeless people in the community. There are addicted people in our community. There are naked people in our community, and they need covering, and they need hope, and they need help, and they need programs, and they need people who look like Jesus, who will be his feet and will be his hands and be his voice, not just to talk to them about righteousness and about justice, but will be the implementers, will be the people, as the writer says here, that repair the breach. Notice what Isaiah says. He says, you will be known as as repair, verse 12, you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. You see, he says, you want a reward? You want acknowledgement? Here's what you'll be known as. Those who repair the breach and those who restore the paths. He says this, and here's the promise. He says, then shall your light break forth. Then shall the despair. You see, listen, let me help you understand something. If you're listening to me this morning and you're discouraged, the way out of discouragement, the way out of despair is not to sit and wait for God to come to you. The way out of discouragement is for you to get up and go be a blessing to somebody else. You see, you think you got it bad? Go to a food pantry. You think you got it bad? Just just go down to a soup kitchen. You think you got it bad? Just take a day and head down to see the rescue mission. You think you got it bad? Just take a moment, go on a trip, take your ladies together and go to the Brevard rescue mission. You think you got it bad? I've been in prison ministry. You think that you got it bad? Go to go walk into a prison, uh, into a jail and hear the, the doors locked behind you and walk with the guard and see the disparity in the place and have to deal with a degree of fear knowing that there could be a riot and you could be trapped and you something got do prison ministry. But also notice what he says. He says, then shall thy light break forth. You want to know one of the beauties of prison ministry? It wasn't the fear. It wasn't the riots. It was that there are people in prison who made mistakes and who need to hear about Jesus. And when they hear about Jesus, their life is radically transformed. And if they have a future, when they get out of prison, it's a future that's filled with hope, that's filled with purpose, that's filled with beauty. It's not about going into prison and tweeting and talking talking bad about them. It's about going into prison and offering them the hope of the gospel. That's the beauty. And that's when you realize, man, I don't got it so bad. That's when you realize the problems I think I have pale in comparison to the problems of those who are broken. You see, think about something for a second. A lot of people don't take the time to think about this. A person in jail loses time, right? They lose time. Well, we measure wealth and accumulate wealth over time, right? You get an annual salary, 30000 a year, 40000 a year, 80000 a year. Well, if I took away eight years of salary from you, wouldn't that put you behind? If I put you in a place where there was no computers, you see, there are prisoners who get out of jail and they have no idea what Twitter is. They have no idea that you no longer fill out a job application in pen and paper that you fill it out on a computer. They have no idea that the world, that the, that the news, that, that the news is, 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 is on social media platforms, YouTube. What's that? And so can you imagine the burden that they face to find a job and to assimilate into a culture that has moved on beyond them? If I were to take you right now, and drop you into 2025, with all the changes, you wouldn't know how to function. You'd have to learn about all the new technology. Now, if I took you back to 1985, you would, you're, you're already ahead of the game advanced. You are, you're you're going to invent the internet. You're going you're gonna to come up with all these ideas to be able to flourish and prosper. But if I dump you in your future, you're not ready for it. And so we must become those who repair the breach and restore the past. And when we become those people, it is there that we find that our burden is lifted, that we're released from our own bondage and addiction, that we are empowered and that we're clothed. 
And then lastly, so first, you must return to an awareness of personal brokenness. Secondly, we must find the fast that the Father approves. And you have the fast laid out here, and you see the rewards of the fast that the Father approves. But lastly, surrender to the Savior's Sabbath. Notice what the Bible says at the end of the text. Now, I want you to understand something. I'm not coming to you this morning as a Sabbath keeper. I'm not coming to you to say, we must return to the Sabbath. So let me give you a a biblical and appropriate perspective of fasting, or excuse me, of the Sabbath. I'm not saying we should return to the Sabbath, but here's what I'm trying to get you to see. The Sabbath in the book of Genesis is the day that God rested and surveyed all that he made and said of all that he made, boy, this is good. He rested and he looked at all of creation and he said, this is good. Of course, this is before the fall. And when the law is implemented, Moses declares to the people to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. You see, for God, this God didn't need rest. God did it as an example to us to look over his creation and to say, man, this good. But we get it twisted. It's not that we rest and look at what we've done and say, boy, this looks good. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The reason we rest is not to look at what we have done, not to look down, it's for us to look up. God rests and looks down. We rest and we look up. So what we do is we rest, we pause from our labor, we pause from our working, we pause from what we're doing, and we look to God and we say, God, what you did is good. Do you see, do, do you see what it is? But, but the problem is we're so busy, we're so engaged, we're so over, we're doing so many things that we're burning out and we're settling. Let me, let me help you. I need you to get this. You see, Jacob and Esau, Esau sells his birthright because he's burnt out. He's tired. And Jacob, who's been conserving his energy, says, I'll feed you if you give me your birthright. The devil is conserving his energy. He's watching you labor and work under the burden and under the bondage. And what he's waiting for you to do is to cry out for some relief. And he'll offer you sustenance in exchange for what is the most prized possession you could ever have. And so what we must learn to do is rest and not look to the world, not look to each other, but look to God. And to realize that everything he's done is good. And it is there that God comes down and he replenishes us and he restores us. You see the Sabbath, and I'm going to show you the Sabbath is in a day. The the Bible says not only was there the Sabbath, which was Saturday, there was also the Sabbath year. So you could have, if you had an indentured servant, a person who had a debt to you, who worked for you to pay off their debt, after seven years, you had to release them from their debt. If there was someone, you had to release them from their bondage. If there was someone who owed you money and they were working and they were paying you money for debt that they owed, after seven years, regardless of the balance owed, you had to let them go. As a matter of fact, we do it on our credit reports. If you have a negative derogatory thing on your credit report, it can only stay on there for seven years. And guess what they got to do? They got to let it go. And so the secular world understands the principle. So there was the Sabbath, the Sabbath day. There was also the Sabbath year. They called it the year after the Sabbath year was called the year of Jubilee. The year of new beginnings. And so what Isaiah is saying and, and here in this, this, this concept of Sabbath, it's not just saying, hey, you need to remember that there's a day you need to worship the Lord. That's not what he's saying. Jesus would transition the concept of Sabbath. Here, in, I believe it's in Matthew, Matthew chapter number 11. You have it, Matthew chapter 11, verse 26. Here's what Jesus says. He says, even so, uh, even so, oh, I'm sorry, that, that's Matthew chapter 11. I don't think that's the right verse. I think I gave you the wrong verse. 
Here's what he says. I'm going to paraphrase it. Jesus says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and I'll give you rest. Take, your, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So for those of us who think that the Sabbath is a day or a year or a celebration, we're missing what Jesus is saying when he says, come unto me for rest. You're not going to find rest. It doesn't matter if you go to church on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Friday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. It doesn't matter if you, you say, okay, well, I'm going to have a Sabbath year every seven years. What I'm submitting to you, while those things have value, while those things have importance, at the end of the day, God is trying to get us to transition away from the days and the feasts and the festivals and bring us to the picture of a person. You see, we must surrender to the Savior's Sabbath. We must come back to the place where we rest from our burdens and we rest from our fighting and we rest from our division and we rest from our warring and we rest from our contention and we rest from our laboring. We must come to the place where we rest and we look to God and we allow God to come down and fill us. You see, listen, have you ever been to a church and you went there thinking you would be filled and you weren't? What happened? Have you ever taken a day of rest? You didn't go to work, you had a day off, but you weren't filled? What happened? It's because the purpose of the Sabbath is not for the day, is not for the, for the year, is not for the, the break, it's not for the reprieve, it's an opportunity for you to look to God and survey all that he's done and to say, you are great and greatly to be praised. You see, you don't need a day for that. You can do that right now. You can do it at seven in the morning. You can do it here at the church. You can do it in your living room. You can do it in your car. You can pause from your laboring. You can pause from your burden and you can come to Jesus and you can lay your burden down and you can receive in exchange for your burden his rest. So what must I do in the face of injustice? Yes, I must work. Yes, I must become aware of my own brokenness and I must begin internal work so that that internal work will ultimately burst forth and affect my home and affect my community and affect my city and affect my country, my state and my country. Yes, I must return to an awareness of my own brokenness and I must have God to search me and to try me, but I must also choose not to sit and fast for my own pleasure. I must choose the disciplines so that God can be glorified in being a blessing to others. And I must surrender to the rest of God that enables me to look up and see his goodness and see his mercy and be transformed. You see, some of us are so head down in the work. We are so focused on what it is that we're trying to accomplish we're so focused on trying to be this future glory version of ourselves. We're so focused on trying to be the best version of what we think we ought to be that we're missing it. Let me give you this illustration and I'll be done. I like to cook. I also like to eat. That's a story for another day. But one of the things that I learned in grilling is you don't just take the meat off the grill and go to cutting it and serving it. You actually, and more specifically when it comes to steak, you have to remove it from the grill, from the adversity, and then you set it aside and you let it rest. And in letting it rest, the flavors, the juices, they work with, beyond what you can see. There's working happening on the inside of the steak, the juices and the heat, and the flavors are figuring themselves out. And if you let it rest long enough when you serve it, it tastes far better than if you had eaten it as soon as it came off the grill. You see, rest for the child of God. We can use that in the context of music. 
in music, in instruments, there's a period of rest. You don't just go through the song, you rest. We're so focused on the next song that we forget to worship where we are. We're so caught up on the next job that we forget to appreciate the one we just completed. We're so caught up on the next house and the next paycheck and the next relationship and the next car that we learn and we fail to appreciate what we have. And it makes us susceptible to all manner of iniquity because we cannot appreciate what we have. And so truthfully, you'll never be satisfied The next car, the next relationship, the next job, the next paycheck won't be enough. And you'll wait for what's next and never enjoy what's now. You see, the children of Israel were so caught up on this future notion that they were failing to realize their present responsibility. To worship God from the heart, not just the hands, and to choose the fast that he approved so that people would, be, people would know who the Savior is. And the Savior is Jesus. And so we must learn to rest and surrender to the one who is Lord of the Sabbath and who says, if you're overwhelmed, if you're heavy laden, if you're broken, and if you're bearing the weight of burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. And so I want to invite you this morning. Maybe you're a child of God. Maybe you're saved. And you're overwhelmed. I've, I, listen, I know when, when my fasting makes me irritable and ill-tempered, makes me divisive and contentious, when I'm angry easily, you know what I need? Rest. You know what Elijah needed in the midst of his fear? Rest. You know what was needed in a house full of people laboring and serving Martha, running around like she's out of her mind trying to keep the house clean and wanting everyone else to have the same level of urgency that she has? You know what Jesus says? Rest. It's okay for you to rest and look to what I have done. You know what it'll make you do when you rest? It'll make you shed tears that wet Jesus' feet, and it'll make you take whatever you have to wash his feet from your tears. When you worship him, and it causes you to arise from that moment and be a completely different person than who you were before you fell at the feet of Jesus. And so I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're following Jesus and you're overwhelmed, you're, you feel like you are the prize horse and you are being whipped and you are being pushed and you are being thrust into more ministry and doing more things, would you take a rest? Would you say, let, would you pause? You know, there's a difference between taking a break and giving up. Would you take a break? Would you rest? And if you are not a follower of Jesus, you too know the weight and burden of trying to perform and do things the right way. Would you turn to Jesus who says your labor and your work is not good enough? You need a savior. Would you turn to the one who is able to take your burden and bear it and exchange your unfinished work for his finished work.